In Islamic tradition, Qums Arabic, Kachem's Arabic pronunciation, Zums, literally one -fifth refers to the historically required religious obligation of any Muslim army to pay one fifth of the spoils of war, the money collected from non believers after a military campaign. This tax was paid to the caliph or sultan, representing the state of Islam. In Sunni Islam tradition, the scope of Qums tax has been Ghanim, which is defined as the spoils of war. In Shia tradition, states Abdulaziz Sashadina, the scope of Qums tax has included, 1 booty al -ghanima, 2 objects obtained from the sea al -ghaz, 3 treasure al 4 mineral resources al 5 gainful earnings arba al business profits, 6 the lawful al -halal, which has become mixed up with the unlawful al -haram, and 7 land which is transferred from a Muslim to a dhimmi a free non-Muslim who is protected by a treaty of surrender by the latter's purchase of it. The recipients of the collected Qums have been the descendants of Muhammad and the Islamic clergy. Qums is a 20% tax that must be paid on all items regarded as ghanima Arabic, al ghanimat booty seized with war. There are differing legal traditions within Islam about what constitutes ghanima, and thus how far reaching Qums should be. In some jurisdictions, Qums included a 20% tax paid on business profit and on minerals extracted in regions under the control of the state. Qums is different and separate from other Islamic taxes such as zakat and jizya. There are differences of opinion about the scope of Qums in Sunni and Shia sects of Islam, as well as who owns it and how the collected Qums should be spent. Topic <inaudible> <inaudible> etymology. The Arabic term Qums literally means one fifth. It is referred to in the Quran in the Surah Al-Anfal, spoils of war, booty especially verse number 41, and in various hadiths. <inaudible> Islamic scriptures Qums and Ghanima are revealed in the Quran. For example, They ask thee concerning things taken as spoils of war. Say, such spoils are at the disposal of Allah and the Messenger, so fear Allah, and keep straight the relations between yourselves, obey Allah and His Messenger, if ye do believe. Say to the unbelievers, if now they desist from unbelief, their past would be forgiven them, but if they persist, the punishment of those before them is already a matter of warning for them. And fight them on until there is no more tumult or oppression, and there prevail Allah altogether and everywhere, but if they cease, verily Allah doth see all that they do. And know that out of all the booty that ye may acquire in war, a fifth share is assigned to Allah, and to the messenger, and to near relatives, orphans, the needy, and the wayfarer, if ye do believe in Allah and in the revelation we sent down to our servant on the day of testing, the day of the meeting of the two forces. For Allah hath power over all things." This teaching is repeated in Sahih Hadiths, books which are considered authentic records of examples set by Muhammad. Narrated Ibn Abbas, the delegates of the tribe of Abdul Qais came and said, O Allah's Apostle. We are from the tribe of Rabia, and there is the infidels of the tribe of Mudur intervening between you and us, so we cannot come to you except in the sacred months. So please order us some instructions that we may apply it to ourselves and also invite our people whom we left behind us to observe as well. Quote, the Prophet said, I order you to do four things and forbid you to do four. I order you to believe in Allah, that is, to testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah the Prophet pointed with his hand, to offer prayers perfectly, to pay zakat, to fast the month of Ramadan, and to pay the kums i.e. one-fifth of the war booty to Allah. When the Messenger of Allah appointed anyone as leader of an army or detachment he would especially exhort him to fear Allah and to be good to the Muslims who were with him. He would say, fight in the name of Allah and in the way of Allah. Fight against those who disbelieve in Allah. Make a holy war, do not embezzle the spoils of war, booty, do not break your pledge, and do not mutilate the dead bodies, do not kill the children. When you meet your enemies who are polytheists, invite them to three courses of action. If they respond to any one of these, you also accept it and withhold yourself from doing them any harm. Invite them to accept Islam, if they respond to you, accept it from them and desist from fighting against them. Then invite them to migrate from their lands to the land of Mahars and inform them that, if they do so, they shall have all the privileges and obligations of the Muhahirs. 
If they refuse to migrate, tell them that they will have the status of Bedouin Muslims and will be subjected to the commands of Allah like other Muslims, but they will not get any share from the spoils of war or FAI except when they actually fight with the Muslims against other disbelievers. If they refuse to accept Islam, demand from them the jizya. If they agree to pay, accept it from them and hold off your hands. If they refuse to pay the tax, seek Allah's help and fight them. Sunnah in Volume 4, Book 52 of Sahih Bukhari is dedicated to Qums. Qums means, one-fifth or twenty percent. In Islamic legal terminology, it means one-fifth of certain items which a person acquires as wealth, and which must be paid to the state of Islam. This is one of many forms of tax in Islamic jurisprudence that applies on ghanima and fai or fe. In early and middle history of Islam, Ghanima was that property and wealth that was looted by the Muslim army after attacking the non-believers in a battle. FAI was that property and wealth that was gained from confiscation without strife, that is if the non-believers refused to fight or violently oppose the raid. Over time, the concept and scope of Ghanima was expanded by Islamic scholars, and variations emerged between Sunni and Shia scholars on interpreting the definition of Ghanima. Similarly, the percentage of FAI was expanded to 100% using verse 59.7 of Quran, thus placing it beyond Qums. The 80% amount left after paying the 20% Qums, was distributed among the army commander and soldiers who attacked the unbelievers, through a lengthy hadith recorded in Kitab al-Kafi. The Prophet Muhammad has mentioned that those entitled to receive al-Qums are the relatives of the Holy Prophet whom Allah has mentioned in his words 26 to 214, warn your close relatives. They are the children of Abdul Muttalib, men and women. None of the families of Quraysh or the Arabs or their slaves are lawful to receive al-Qums. The charities of the masses of people is lawful for their slaves to consume. One whose mother is from the family of Banu Hashim and his father from the masses of people, the charities are lawful for such person to consume. Such person is not entitled to receive from al Qums because Allah, the Most High has said, Call them sons of their own fathers. 33-5 Ghanima <laughs> The items eligible for Qums are referred to as Ghanima al Ghanimat in the Quran. The Arabic word Ghanima, also referred to as Ghanima, Ghanaim, Itindam in Africa and Asia, has been interpreted to have several meanings Spoils of war, or war booty looted or confiscated from enemy, non-believers of Islam, Prophet, Minerals or any other form of buried treasure. According to medieval Muslim scholars Al Tusi and Al Hakim, seven items were subject to Qums 20% tax Al Ghanima, booty seized during a raid and the spoils of war. Arbdh al Md Kasab, the profit or the surplus of the income. Al Hard M, al Haldal, the legitimately earned wealth which has become mixed with illegitimate wealth. All madden, mines and mineral resources extracted anywhere within the Islamic State. al ghaz objects obtained from sea. All cans, treasure found. Tthe land which is transferred to a non-Muslim dhimmi when the later buys it from a Muslim, and which was previously acquired by the Islamic State by a treaty of surrender by the dhimmis. Sunni scholars have confined the Qums 20% tax to apply on only two items, Al Ghanima, booty seized during a raid and the spoils of war. Al Madan, mines and mineral resources extracted anywhere within the Islamic State. After paying the 20% Qums tax, the remaining 80% of the booty seized, spoils of war and treasure found was distributed between the commanders and soldiers as a reward for the effort, making the raid or going to war against non Muslims. The origins of the Qums, states Abdulaziz Sashadina, go back to the pre-Islamic Arab custom wherein the chief was entitled to one-fifth of the ghanima booty in addition to the safw al-ndl the portion of the booty which especially attracted him. The remainder of the booty was normally divided among the raiders who had accompanied the chief, but the latter reserved the right to dispose of the ghanima as he chose. <laughs> Shia policy Qums, in the Shia tradition, is applied to the business profit, or surplus, of a business income. It is payable at the beginning of the financial year, though this is regarded as being the time at which the amount becomes clear. Ghanima and one-fifth tax of Qums applies wherever gain or profit is involved. Ghanima 
has two meanings as mentioned above. The second meaning is illustrated by the common use of the Islamic banking term, al gum bil gurm, meaning, gains accompany liability for loss or risk. In 13th century Shia region, the Qums was divided into two portions. One portion went to the descendants of Muhammad, the other portion was divided equally and one part given to imam and clergy, while the other part went to the orphaned and poor Muslims. The famous view of contemporary faqis is that imam's portion during the occultation Islam is used in the fields that marja taqlid has valid knowledge, doubt that if the infallible imam would be apparent, he would use it in those ways, such as reinforcing Islam and seminary, Islam promotion, building mosques in necessary situations, libraries and schools affairs, handling old people, and actually all blessing affairs in the order of priority and their religious significance. Qums became a major source of income and financial independence of the clergy in Shia regions. This practice has continued among Shia Muslims. It is narrated in Kitab al Kafi that Imam Musa al Qadim would accept one dirham from the people, although he was of the wealthiest in the city of Medina, to purify them. He compares this to Allah asking his creatures to lend to him from their property, not because he is need, but rather it is his rights as appointed guardian over his creatures. Scholars of the four Sunni schools of fiqh, Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i and Hanbali, have historically considered comes 20% tax to applicable on ghanayim property, movable and immovable booty seized in any raid or as a result of actual warfare, as well as buried treasure or resources extracted from land, sea, mines of any kind. Others, such as Abu Ubaid and Kardawi, the Qums applies to any windfall for Muslims, but not to income as is the case according to Shia scholars. Hanafith 8th century Hanafi scholar Abu Yusuf stated, according to Abdulaziz Sashadina, that the Qums collected was historically distributed into three equal portions, one for Muhammad, which went to the Caliph or Sultan after Muhammad's death, the second portion to the family of Muhammad, and the third portion among Muslim orphans, poor, and wayfarers. Abu Hanifa stated that the portion meant for Muhammad and his family should be used instead for amassing weapons and growing the Muslim army for further raids and wars with unbelievers. Al Shaybani interpreted Abu Hanifa to be suggesting that the collected Qums tax should be spent equally on Muslim orphans, poor, and warfarers. Maliki Malik ibn Anas, the founder of Maliki sect of Sunni Islam, stated that the right to spend the Qums belonged to the Caliph Imam after the death of Muhammad, and he had freedom to dispose the 20% Qums tax collected from war booty between poor and rich as he wishes, and that he may, if he desired, give any part of the Qums tax to Muhammad's family. Shafi'i al Shafi'i, the founder of Shafi'i Madhab of Sunni Islam, provided two scenarios on how 20% Qums tax on seized raid and war booty was to be spent. He explained that during the time Muhammad was alive, Qums was divided into five portions. The first portion were for Allah and his messenger and given to Muhammad, the second portion was for Muhammad's family members, the remaining three to Muslim poor, orphans, and warfarers. After Muhammad's death, the Qums tax was divided into four portions, one for the family of Muhammad, and the other three for the general good of all Muslims. Most Muslim scholars after al-Shafi'i agreed that a portion of the 20% Qums tax should go to the descendants of Muhammad, but they disagreed on who these rightful descendants were. These Islamic scholars also concurred that Qums tax should be spent, among other things, to maintain the Muslim army and the general good of the Muslims. Qums in history Topic. Africa Qums was practiced by Muslim commanders who raided African communities from 8th century through early 20th century. However, Qums was treated as a concept and the share of booty transferred to the Islamic State was 50%. For example, the West African Muslim ruler Haman Yaji in 1919, recorded in his diary, I raided the pagans of Roa and captured 50 cattle and 33 slaves. We calculated my fifth share as 17 slaves and 25 cattle." Similarly, from 8th to 10th century, the Berber people in North Africa were treated as pagans, raided and the booty of seized wealth and slaves were subject to Coombs. Europe From 8th century onwards, southern Europe became a target of raids and military campaigns from Morocco and by the Ottoman Sultanate. 
After the conquest of Cordoba by Muslim armies, Qums of all movable booty seized from Christians and Jews after war was transferred to Caliphal treasury, the rest distributed among the commanders and Muslim soldiers of invading army. According to Musa Nusair, the army commanders also set aside 20% of land vacated by non-Muslims to the Caliph. The land that was surrendered by Christians and Jews, but not vacated, became subject to jizya payable by the dhimmis. However, Ibn Hazm states that Muslim soldiers did not set aside or pay kums from the looted property or riches from the annexed land, each kept the spoils for himself. This became one source of distrust and dispute between the Muslim rulers and clergy based in Africa and the new Caliphate of Cordoba in southwestern Europe. Outside Spain, Ghanima and Fay were sought from Muslim conquests in Sicily, Greece and Caucasian region of Europe. Coombs was paid from all seized movable property to the Caliphal treasury. Topic. India From 10th century through the 18th century, Muslim armies raided non-Muslim kingdoms of India. Some of these Muslim armies came from northwest, consisting of Turco-Mongols, Persians and Afghans. In other times, these were commanders of Delhi Sultanate. War spoils and looted movable property from infidels Hindus, Jains, Buddhists was subject to Qums. The 20% tax was transferred to the treasury of the Sultanate, and the 80% was distributed among the commanders, mounted soldiers and foot soldiers. The mounted soldiers were given two to three times as much of the war booty as the foot soldiers. The collected war booty from the treasuries and temples of Hindus were an incentive for war, and the Qums Ghanima tax a source of wealth for the sultans in India. One such loot was from Warangal, and it included the Koh i Noor, one of the largest known diamonds in human history. See also Zakat Kar al Hassan Jizya Karaj Nisab Dhimmi List of battles of Muhammad Criticism of Twelver Shia Islam References External links Muhammad ibn al Hassan Tusi, Concise Description of Islamic Law and Legal Opinions, p. 149, at Google Books, sections 12 and 13, pages 149 to 151, 11th century Shia views on Qums, Ghanaim, and Anfal. Abdulaziz Sashadina, Journal of Near Eastern Studies, Vol. 39, No. 4, October, 1980, pp. 275 to 289 all Qums the fifth in the Imamishish legal system Qums an Islamic tax